Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. And uh, I'm going to try to speak into the microphone so everyone can hear me. But if you can't, would you just raise your hand or give a shout out? Um, you can't hear me. OK. <laughs> Already, you can't hear me. That doesn't. Uh, this way? That's better? OK. <laughs> All right. Um, as we've heard a little bit already today about Fort Ruby, it was established in 1862 at the intersection of the Central Route and Hastings Cutoff near Overland Pass at the southern end of Ruby Valley. In this talk, um, I'll be reviewing some of the highlights of the fort history and um, some of the excavations and in investigations we did for over, um, between 2005 and 2011. Let's see. Um, the fort's location was chosen as the midpoint between Fort Churchill near Carson City and Fort Douglas in Salt Lake on the Overland Mail and Stage Route, which was also being used by an increasing number of immigrants. With immigrants destroying traditional food resources, competition for survival led to violent conflicts, as we've heard earlier today. And so there was a need for um, a post at, at in Ruby Valley. In 1860, they set up a temporary camp, but then in 1861, the Civil War started and most of the military were pulled back into the East Coast. So the, the uh, uh, manning of Fort Ruby was going to be with volunteers. Let's see. Um, and, okay, so, <laughs> sorry. The mission of the post was to guard the Overland Route from Austin, Nevada to the Utah border and the immigrant trail to north to the headwaters of the Humboldt River. Patrols were responsible for protecting 36 stations with 60 wagons and 190 horses and 22 drivers. The soldiers were infantry for the most part, so patrolling the road was on foot. This Pony Express station, um, the fort was built in, uh, two miles away from the Pony Express station, which was also the Overland uh, stage station there in Ruby Valley. The stage station might look familiar because it was dismantled in 1960 and reassembled in front of the museum here. Colonel Patrick Connor was assigned the task of establishing the fort. Connor pulled together men from Sacramento and marched to Fort Churchill, where they stayed for about a month gathering more men and equipment, and then marched to the site of Fort Ruby. Due to the look of the landscape, Connor saw it as a desolate place and once wrote, understand Ruby Valley is a bleak, inhospitable place. No forage, no lumber, nothing to build with, and as far as the Indians are concerned, no need for a um, military fort. With the military installed at Fort Ruby, attempts were made to end the violence and develop a treaty. The Treaty of Ruby Valley was signed in the fall of 1863. As we've heard earlier, 11 Shoshone leaders signed the document along with the colonel at the, at the fort and the territorial governor of Nevada. In this photo, it shows um, Captain Buck. He was one of the signatures, signatures on, the, on the Treaty of Ruby Valley. The picture of him was taken by Timothy O'Sullivan, who was we'll learn a little bit more about later on. <laughs> during the, uh, I said that during the Civil War, the post was manned by volunteer units from California and then Nevada. While the mission of the station was to patrol the roads, the men found some diversions from the routine. Dances and visits to the Overland Station relieved the monotony at this remote outpost. An elaborate 4th of July, 1863 celebration was described in the San Francisco newspaper with the gallant soldier boys decorating the mess hall and hosting a sumptuous repast, and, and followed by a music and dancing until a late hour. The Civil War ended in the spring of 1865, but it took until December to move the 9th U.S. Infantry, Company I, out to Fort Ruby. The assignment to the fort was not looked upon with favor. Issues with the company commanders caused the last few years of the fort to be embroiled in controversy. The last commander and his lieutenant were court-martialed. In 1869, the fort closed and all of the men moved to Fort Halleck. 
An interesting side note is that in the summer of 1868, the 40th Parallel Survey Team camped outside the fort in July. The hearse driven with mules was modified by the photographer Timothy O'Sullivan as his darkroom during the expedition. Photos taken by O'Sullivan, of Captain Buck was one of them, um, he took three photos of the fort and those are the only known to exist. O'Sullivan's photos of Fort Ruby provide details about the appearance and arrangement of the buildings. This is Officer's Row. I'll be pointing out um, some more important details later, but just wanted to draw your attention to the rather unkept grounds. After six years, the parade ground was just a weedy patch with a few foot trails through it. There weren't any rock-lined paths, plantings, or stockade walls surrounding the fort. This was a very rough post. And if you remember the Fort Laramie photos of the high uh, high walls and, and um, positions um, outside of it. This was very rough. This O'Sullivan photograph shows a wealth of information. For instance, the post in the front of the hospital with a triangular um, vessel, on, oops, sorry, vessel on top is a rain gauge that was um, sent out to each of the posts for the post surgeon to uh, collect information about the weather. The building to the right is the quartermaster's warehouse where all the supplies were stored. The quartermaster was in charge of the subsistence orders and deliveries and keeping account of the records. The soldier, oh, that's um, the surgeon, probably George Gwyther at the time of this um, photo. And this man in the background is at order arms as um, his patrol duty f for protecting the, the, the uh, quartermaster's storehouse. This is the enlisted men's barracks. Noteworthy in this photograph is the large new building with stacks of lumber in front of it. It seems odd to us that they would be busy building with the fort, decommissioned to a camp, and, was, and, were being, and it was being considered for closing even in 1868. Also interesting is the upright log building in the background and the round log building at the far end of the new barracks, showing the difference in construction styles. After the fort closed, the buildings were auctioned off to local far ranchers who used the materials to build buildings on their ranches. A few years after the fort closed, jo Joseph Toganini and his brother-in-law set up a ranch on the site. The Toganinis owned the ranch until about 1947. By the mid-1950s, the ranch owners thought that the Palisade Log Building was an officer's house and the Horizontal Log Building was, a, um, was known as Uncle Billy's Trading Post. However, there's no record of Uncle Billy having a trading post at Fort Ruby, and the officer's house does not match any of the quarters in the photo of by O'Sullivan. Unfortunately, the last... Um, the... Uh, Two buildings burned that were thought to be first, um, the fort buildings in 1992 before um, Fish and Wildlife acquired the property. So we don't really have any good documentation of those buildings. Fast forward to 2002 when the Fish and Wildlife Service acquired the ranch for inclusion in the Ruby Lake National Wildlife Refuge. And despite a well-known historic site, after 150 years, it was hard to imagine that anything from the fort might still exist. Thus, finding the fort was going to be challenging. For the next part of the talk, I'll be discussing the discovery of the officer's row and sharing some of the highlights of our excavations. So where exactly is the fort? We have a map from 1869 that shows the buildings widely scattered between the section line uh, and the section corners. If you tried to overlay the map um, over the aerial photo, you can imagine that if the, if the uh, buildings were all the way up at the section corner, it would be a huge, huge fort. In 2005, we hosted the first Passport and Time Volunteer Project and our, focused our efforts on the west side of the section line. If you remember that, all the buildings were on the west side of the section line, looking for the officers' houses. Luckily, we found a privy which, in a location about where the house should be. And the, with the privy thought to have been, you know, always behind the houses, that should have been where the lineup of the houses should have been. And we found a row of palisade logs, um, upright posts, 
remains were in the middle of like where the parade ground is, where there shouldn't have been a building. So we had to go back and look at the maps and look at our photos and try to recalculate where the, where the buildings might have been. Because there was nothing on the surface that would indicate where the buildings were. In 2007, we hosted the second pit project and focused on locating structural remains of the buildings, ignoring the maps and, and just looking at what the excavation um, uh, um, results had, we'd had before. With some luck, we uncovered the stone foundation for a chimney base and the remains of a portion of a palisade log wall. The upright logs had been cut off at ground level, leaving just the, the stumps of the logs in the ground. So the upright post, what I'm calling palisade logs, is uh, vertical posts that are, you dig a trench, put the logs in it, and, and then um, sort of tie them together with a few nails. But it's pretty simple construction style. In 2008, we went back with a small crew to finish excavating the outline of the building. By following the stumps of the palisade posts to the southern end of the building, we found the stone hearth foundation at the other end. This allowed us to pinpoint the size and shape of the building footprint. So, we went back and found the, other, the southern end of the same building. And, based on the outline and orientation of the building, it matches the first northernmost building of the officer's row. And the mountains behind the photos also lines up with building one, as we called it. So now we can describe this building from its archaeological signature as a rectangular palisade log construction, roughly 20 by 30 feet, on a 70 degree slant um, north-south. The construction method of setting up bright logs in the trench, as I was describing before, is a very simple way of putting together buildings. We assumed that um, the because there's only one building in the officer's row built in this construction style, but the hospital and the quartermaster's buildings were uh, uh, stockade, upright stockade construction, and one of the barracks were, that those would have been built the first year the fort was um, uh, established. And they, when they got there in September of 1862, they were probably scrambling to get wood and materials to build the, a few buildings to stay the winter in. Surgeons assigned to the fort were civilians and usually served for about one year. Ar artifacts related to the doctor included several medicine bottles and some glass tubes. In 2009, another Passport in Time project continued excavations focusing on locating the commanding officer's residence in a small building adjacent to it. We found no trace of the small building, but were successful in finding a stone foundation with the same orientation as Building 1, it was 30 feet long. The building matches the approximate size and orientation for the front porch of the commanding officer's house. This was um, identified as building three for us. So this is the commanding officer's residence and number three and, and then the building two, the little building next to it. The cam I also want to note the commanding officer's house is the only one with a front porch and is larger size than any of the others as per military protocol to have the commanding officer in the highest status, more uh, footage for his um, family. Also, the mountain howitzer position next to the commander's house and in front of building two suggests that building two may have been the paymaster's office based on the slot in the door. And uh, one other item to note in this photo is the woman sitting on the front porch. There is no record, record of a wife or family stationed at the fort at any time. The archaeological evidence of who lived in Building 3 includes toys, a marble and a porcelain doll's head, a variety of tablewares, bottles, etched glass stemware, buttons that include several dress buttons from women's clothing. There are higher status and more um, um, tablewares that were like serving vessels and things like that. One of the duties of the commanding officer was to share his house and mess with the um, lower rank officers and visitors. And that appears to have been going on here too. There's also no evidence of children being present at the fort, so finding toys was also a surprise. A variety of ammunition was found at Fort Ruby, reflecting the changes in gun manufacturing, improvements in the firing mechanisms developed during the 1860s. The older style mini balls with percussion caps were replaced with bullets and cartridges. 
Of note in the upper corner is a unique 32 caliber teat fire cartridge patented in 1864 and possibly used with a more front loading revolver. This ammunition and gun were not Army issue and would have been brought to the fort by an officer as a personal sidearm, probably within Nevada volunteers. This drawing was done by one of our volunteers, Colonel Dan Rathbun, and is based on a multiple sources, including the O'Sullivan photos, the archaeological remains, maps, and best guesses. The fort only operated for seven years, then most of the buildings were removed and the location operated and location um, it was a working ranch for more than a hundred years. The site has experienced a lot of disturbances. We did not find any evidence of the hospital or quartermaster's buildings or the enlisted men's barracks, even though we tried metal detecting and ground penetrating radar and testing and all kinds of things. It just looks like there's been too much disturbance to those parts of the, of the site. Also, I'd like to point out the... Um, I, don't have, I don't have a pointer, but... Towards the trees, there's a spring house, and there's a little log cabin sort of over by where Nevada is written on the map that are outside the footprint of the fort. So I'll be talking about those two buildings in a minute. I'd also like to point out the building that has a little square around, um, just up from the spring house. So that's about where that building that was um, thought to be an officer's house that burned in 1992. We think that's where that building was. And it was probably the blacksmith shop because of its location closer to the spring and um, down closer to where the meadows would have been, where there would have been adequate grass for any horses. The cavalry that was um, assigned to this post was never really at this post. They were always on assignment. So there wasn't a big cavalry um, uh, collection here, so there wasn't a barn or stables or things like that at Fort Ruby. And um, there was about 200 men at any one time at Fort Ruby, mostly and mostly all in, um, infantry. So the spring house appears to be a Fort Era building. We restored it between 2010 and 2012. Um, when we were working on it, the stones used to build it are very similar to the stones used for the foundation and hearse that we had uncovered for the officer's row. So we we're pretty, pretty sure that this is a, a true Fort Ruby building. The building was likely used to store fresh foods. Food supplies sent to the fort would mostly have been canned, dried, packed in salt, or pickled. Thus, fresh fruits and vegetables um, were at a premium and may have been available through the Overland Ranch. There's also a mention of a fort um, garden in the post records. We also have we also recovered um, bone from deer and um, and birds in their in the material, suggesting that they were also hunting um, to supplement their diet. The log cabin is kind of a mystery. It does not appear in any map or photograph of the fort and is out, like I said, is outside the, the main rectangular, rectangle of the shape of the, of the fort. When we compared this photo of, the fort, of this building with the other fort buildings that are neatly trimmed, um, have shing shingle roofs and whitewashed appearance, this one stands out as being completely different. This one, we speculated, could either be um, the sutler, which operated a store usually at, at forts or posts, or it could have been the, built for the laundresses. There were usually laundresses at, um, at forts, but there's no mention of, of them in the, in the company records. We received a research grant from the Southern Nevada Lands Management Act, which helped with the building, uh, fund the building restoration and some of the archeological studies. It also helped um, with um, building the and developing an interpretive trail with an, um, interpretive panels. The, the fort is open to the public. There's just a, a gate that you can go through, but um, it's, it's not manned or anything, so you can just, it's a self-guided tour. These are some of the panels that will be, um, are, that are present out there, discussing the, um, Fort Ruby in its um, condition, and 
some of the things that we found while we were excavating out there. And a little bit more about the, the soldiers in the central route. Fort Ruby was established at a place in time of crossroads. The influx of immigrants and the commerce, cro commerce crossing the state of Nevada collided with the traditional life of Native Americans. Fort Ruby remains a place that represents the complicated history of Western Nevada. As we heard earlier today, there's a lot of mixed emotions about Fort Ruby, but it is one of those interesting places that is pivotal in history. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the many volunteers who worked on this project. We had volunteers almost every year who did an amazing job excavating through the Passport in Time project, which is a Forest Service um, volunteer program. If you're interested in doing archaeological projects or historic preservation projects, they link people up with um, interesting projects, and it's a fabulous program. And last but not um, and also I'd like to um, invite you, if you're interested in learning more about Fort Ruby, we are just finishing up a booklet that includes the history and some of the archaeological investigation results. Um, it's in its final stages, and, but printing could take a while. So if you're interested in getting a copy, if you could send me an email, and then I can either put you on the list for, list for a printed copy, or if you'd rather have a, a PDF copy, that might be done a little bit sooner than the printed copy. So anyway, thank you very much.